Well, thank you for jumping on to get into the unsolved case of Timothy Pitson. I, I so it was between this one and Brian Schaefer, and we're definitely going to do Brian Schaefer at some point. But I, I was listening to um, disappearances uh, on Parcast. I love that podcast. If I can plug another one, but. I had listened to the Timothy Pitson story, which I kind of knew. I don't know if you'd ever heard it before or not, but I was <laughs> enthralled in bed. I shouldn't listen to these horizontal. It's too much. So was Timothy Pitson one that you had never heard of before, and then you listened to it on this podcast? No, 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 no. Oh. I knew the story before, okay. but I, I only knew it like very minimally. I was like, yeah, I know it's an unsolved case that involves like a little boy, and there are some like odd circumstances with the mother. But then to listen through, like, a true, uh, the full, like, arc of the story, I was, my eyes shot open. (laughs) I mean, how could they not? The story is unbelievable. Um, It's, I mean, I'll I'll plug my favorite word. It's sinister. No, you have to do what what we, (laughs) you have to do the syllables. You have to go sinister. (laughs) <laughs> I, I recently called out to Sue when I was listening back to the pod, and I was like, "Why do I? Why do I like over enunciate the syllables of words where I'm like, oh, it's wild, it's sinister. It's I'll probably do it today. Sinister. Uh, well, we <laughs> creepers. We're trying to come up with a new um, drinking game, which drinking could just be a diet <laughs> coke. We're not saying it needs to be alcoholic, um, but we we're trying to come up with like little things that we do on. The podcast, and so Silas does his syllables stretch out, and I, <laughs> and I go, oh my god! <laughs> no, it's the gasps. It's the gasps they love. No, they were like her I, dramatic gasps are so good. I gasp, but I also go, oh my god, oh my you do, god. no, you do. <laughs> <laughs> like you're literally like my mic isn't turning on. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> You know what? No, you know what you're also really good for? You do a lot of hard teas. Like, I'll say something really dramatic and you'll go, what? <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> it's so rich. Oh, you should be a voice creepers. actress. Like, uh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Um, creepers, I will do my best to make sure that the oh my gods are warranted from now on. <laughs> <laughs> They're always warranted. These stories are crazy. I mean, they're wild. They, they, they are wild. They are wild. <laughs> oh my god. Well, thank you to all the creepers who are listening and who continue to listen to Creep Time, the podcast. We have been loving your support as of late. Thank you so much. It means a lot to us. And it really means a lot to us when you spread the word about Creep Time. Thank you for doing so because I do see you guys online spreading the word and sharing the podcast with like your friends. Your family. Someone, I saw someone online who said they're like, "I played this for my boss." <laughs> and I was like, "Damn!" But we appreciate that support. We love that you guys spread the word. That is amazing. Oh my gosh! Yes, thank you so much, creepers. And I, I hope that uh, whoever that was got a raise. I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we find, they've been let go, terminated <laughs> I immediately. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> uh, under internal investigation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That that's a violation of HR right there. Absolutely. I would also say, I mean, whatever platform you listen to Creep Time, the podcast on, I think the majority of you guys are kind of split between Spotify and Apple. Please, please, please rate Creep Time, the podcast. Um, If you're enjoying it and if you want to support us diving a bit further into some of these unsolved cases, those positive ratings really do help. And as Sue has mentioned previously in other episodes, if you are a big fan of Creep Time, the podcast, we would highly, highly suggest that you subscribe to premium content which is completely ad free but also we have something that we're planning coming up because if you have oh they must all know this by now but if you have not heard since our last episode the boy in the box a news story a major news story in the true crime world has broken out that they're they've identified him they're going to have a press conference this coming week to name the boy in the box after 65 (laughs) years that's insane to me. I insane. can't take that. Insane, insane because I can't believe they've identified him, and also insane that this is now the second time this has happened to us. So, creepers, whatever, like magic juju you all have, please continue to give it to this podcast because something's working where we're able to like it. So, something good's going on. The manifestation is unmatched. Yes. It's- Something good, yeah. Something good is truly brewing. I, I mean, do you have any theory? Do you think it's probably the the latter story, the latter theory that we covered, where it was the mother who purchased that boy? I mean, 
your, that guess, I think, is as good as any other. I mean, I think w- what we said was that was sort of the only theory by the end of it that we could really cling to, right? That's what I, that's what I'm thinking, and I guess nothing's really off the table because we have no official statement. Although I did see somebody on Reddit who claimed to have like insider information ahead of time, and they're saying that like he was a foster kid who just like fell through the cracks. So with that, let's dive into the case. Are you ready? I'm ready. And you've done research on this too. I'm excited. I have. I have. It was tough research to do. I mean, once again, anything with kids, I think is always a little bit tougher to kind of stomach. So, um, it is. Yeah. Especially a case as senseless as this. It seems mm -hmm. it not, the pieces don't quite fit together for me for a lot of this and like her reasoning. Um, same here, but there's so much to contrast that, that like every inch of this was deliberate, but I will dive into the top line just for anybody who does not know the story of Timothy Pitson. So, on the morning of May 11th, 2011, six-year-old Timothy Pitson was dropped off at his elementary school by his father. His mother was also in the car. Within just 30 minutes of him getting dropped off, Timothy's mother is seen on security camera, and she comes to the school, and she pulls him out of class, saying there's a family emergency, even though there wasn't one, and they drive out of town together. So... She had Timothy in her possession over the next couple of days, and she's kind of carting him around to different, like, resorts and, like, water parks, zoos. She's buying him, to- like, toys. And then, on the second day, she's unexpectedly caught on camera, and she's alone. We don't know where Timothy went. So following his on-camera sighting at 10 a.m. earlier that morning at a resort as they were walking out, he was never seen again. So the question still remains... Why why did his mother pull him out of school? Why did she skip town? And what did she do with him? This is the unsolved mystery of Timothy Pitson. It's it's kind of haunting. I mean, we co- we've covered cases in the past that have, you know, dealt with minors or dealt with kids or especially I mean, obviously disappearances, but there is something very dark to this to me. Yeah. Oh gosh. I mean, for me with with any of these cases where I tend to get really sensitive is when time starts elapsing and the chances for the person to have lived grow and grow and grow, like, and it just really is so unsettling to me how long he was kind of with her and innocently um, going along with everything and not knowing what was going on. And all the chances. Thinking it was like a mommy son trip. Yes. Like, and also like a a dream for a six-year-old, like to be, going out and doing all this fun stuff with his mom and kind of unknowingly being part of a really dark, um, plot plot. Really? Yeah. A plot to hide him. Mm -hmm. Well, if he, I mean, I I suppose in either scenario, whether he's dead or alive, he is hidden, but I'm going to get into some of the backstory just to color the story a little bit more and figure out like where we are, who these people were and maybe give some motive and, uh, context to why Amy was doing what she did. So, The backstory starts in Aurora, Illinois, which is a suburb that's just outside of Chicago. And from everything I saw, I think this is like the second or third largest city in Illinois. Did you read that too? Oh, no, I didn't realize. Yeah, no, it's pretty big, although it still has this very like suburban small town feel. Mm -hmm. Um, It's generally thought of as like a very safe area. Like this is a good place to raise a family. They have good schools. There are good jobs nearby. Um, I think both Amy and... James worked in town. Amy definitely did. She was uh, working for a property management um, firm because she was able to walk to her house. So a few years earlier, um, before Timothy was born, early 2000s, this is when James and Amy first meet. And they kind of started their whole lives in this town, right? Like they had gotten married, they bought a home together, they had their child, Timothy, and he was their whole world from everything I read. But then... As life feels sort of blissfully normal, I'm questioning, I'm like, when does this all start to go wrong Mm -hmm. in their marriage and for this family? So I would turn our attention over to the morning of May 11th, 2011, when all of this happens. So the routine of this morning typically starts that Amy is the one who takes Timothy to school. She drops him off. Um, But this morning was a little bit different. And we would learn that that was deliberate because Amy is experiencing like a, a spat of vertigo 
So she tells James this, and he's like, I don't think it's a good idea that you drive, so how about I take Timothy to school and I'll drop you off at work, right? So that's exactly what he does. So they get to the elementary school, Timothy hops out, he goes inside, and then James leaves Amy at her place of work. And like I said, she works at a property management company that's very close to the school, and according to James, their last interaction was actually pretty, it was pretty sweet and gentle, I mean, they kiss goodbye, they say their I love yous, and she gets out and James just drives away. And to give more context to that relationship and just push it a little bit further, James and Amy, um, this would have been a good day for them, according to him, because they had been having marital problems for a while. So it, it just seemed a little odd to him that, you know, oh, you know, we're, we're coming off of a, another big fight and you seem to be okay. But that couldn't have been further from the truth. So... One of their most recent fights that I was able to dig up on, I'm not sure if you read this, but Amy, it had to do with Amy's birthday that happened maybe a few weeks prior, where she took a girl's trip, or maybe just a trip to the Bahamas with one friend or something, and James was kind of upset that he wasn't included, but I, I don't know, that doesn't that sound a little weird to you? Like, especially if it's like just her and one other woman, like, that's a little funny for him to get upset but maybe I don't have the full context I don't know yeah it does sound super weird I mean I think it's pretty obvious that things were not great in their relationship um Mm -hmm. and I mean I wonder if there was sort of a like controlling dynamic or something but um I don't know it's weird I watched some clips of him on the Mm -hmm. news and he he struck me as like a pretty um like gentle natured person and from what I kind of read about Amy and I'm not trying to villainize her in any capacity but um she I mean she had had I think this was her fourth marriage I believe Um, it was yeah yeah so I think that like maybe relationships in general for her were not like the easiest um so we just don't know like what the dynamics really were at home but um no I agree with you I I have found it really hard to kind of pieced together because I've also seen clips of James and I don't take those fully at face value because anyone can present anything on camera, right. you know, but, uh, because she insinuates that he's, I don't know, she's kind of painting this picture later on of the story that he's some sort of, um, a monster or he's controlling. Mm-hmm. I never got that impression from watching him. Police never found any evidence of that or any evidence of abuse, but I also really don't know what was going on inside Amy's head, which is why I was going to get into some of like her health ailments, because like I said, She does have issues with vertigo, but outside of that, she has some pretty severe issues with her mental health and Mm -hmm. this ongoing battle with depression for which she takes prescription medication for. And we would learn that around the time that all of this happens, she had stopped taking that medication for an unspecified amount of time. So that is a huge window into uh, the flux of someone's mental health and, and, I don't know, the sense of mania she could have been experiencing, right? Right, right. Yeah, so I'm not sure, like, how much of her detailed perception towards the latter half of the story of James, I guess, was accurate. But, yeah, I guess it's a good point. She had had three previous marriages that had gone south, so Which, relationships might have been difficult for her. Yeah, no no shade to her for that, but uh, or to anybody that's had multiple marriages. But, I mean, I think from what I kind of researched, like, she just... Like, there was a part of her that didn't want to be in the marriage anymore, really. And maybe that's her Mm -hmm. own... um, I'm just speculating, but, you know, her own... No, there's um, some evidence to support that, though. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was, you know, definitely affected by her own mental health and wanting to just, like, be left alone. I think that happens a lot of times. Like, when you're going through all that kind of stuff, you're just like, I just want out. I don't want to, like, be beholden to anything. Like, I'm, Yeah. you know, so... I, I also think I wondered, I'm like, I don't know if it was the failure of the marriage that was so devastating for her so much as it was the fear of what the custody battle might look like, exactly. what the aftermath of the divorce might look like. Exactly. I think that's what really sent her into a spiral. Yep. So what happens a little later in this day? So like I said, James, he drives away, leaving Amy at work, assuming that he's going to be back to pick up Timothy at like 1030 a.m. because he's only six, so he's on like half days I guess I forgot all about that (laughs) that like you do like for certain like um ages in school like if you're like pre-k or something you don't do a full day of school sounds Mm -hmm. incredibly inconvenient (laughs) it does (laughs) me as a non-parent I'm like 
bats. Yeah, like, <laughs> I know. I know. I'm like, you, you keep them until I'm out of work. Literally. Like, but, yeah, so he assumes he's going to have to go back at 1030, like, dip from work and then come pick him up and bring him home uh, with a babysitter or wherever he's going to bring him, childcare. But within 30 minutes of him dropping off Timothy... Amy had arrived back at that school, and we know this because we see her come in on security camera, and she goes to the front desk, and she tells them, there's a family emergency, I have to pull Timothy from class. She does not give specifics, because the school knows both Amy and James kind of equally, so there's trust there. But of course, I mean, they release Timothy to his mother, why would they not? If a mother comes in and says, there's been a family emergency, he has to come home. You really don't ask questions, right? No. I I, I do... Um... Did you watch the footage where she's checking him out of school by chance? I did. I did. Uh, is it, I don't know if this thought crossed your mind, but I started kind of uh, like envisioning what it must have been like to like be the receptionist there and kind of like, I, I just wondered how great of an actor Amy was in that moment or like if that receptionist had any gut instincts, um, which of course I don't think we'll ever know, but that thought came across my mind just imagine yeah, or i mean i mean the immense guilt yeah that i'm sure like someone in that office might have felt for not calling the other parent totally. and i'm sure i am sure protocol changed after this i know i know oh my Ugh. god but what happens is by 10 30 a.m like i said james he leaves his job um he works at a design firm and it's not very far but he heads over to timothy's school like i said to go pick him up where he gets there and he's shocked because the receptionist is shocked. She was like, Timothy was picked up more than two hours ago by his mother. He has no idea why. But this isn't immediate cause for concern. He's mostly just kind of confused and he's like frustrated and annoyed that he wasn't looped into whatever is going on. So he tries to call Amy, but she won't pick up the phone. So he would end up calling her repeatedly and she's continuing to ignore his calls. And this is when a little bit of the anxiety starts to climb because something seems off there's something wrong with this situation so he starts calling around to amy's sister as well as other members of the family just to see like you know have you heard from her do you know where she is what's going on i have no idea where she took timothy they had no knowledge either they didn't know that she had intentions to go pick him up and they also don't know where she is they can't get a hold of her either at this point so she t- she got him put him in her car drove off and no one knows why it's a bit shocking so by that evening he gets home and he starts kind of looking around the house to see like if they left he was like did she take like clothing did she take a bag like what what did she grab he opens the medicine cabinet and his heart kind of sinks because he sees her medicine um her bottles they're completely full Mm. she hasn't been taking her mood stabilizer she hasn't been taking her antidepressants for quite some time at this point so this is when that concern um, really starts to grow for him that he thinks she might be experiencing some kind of a severe mood swing, if not maybe a breakdown. Uh, So he calls police in Aurora. Um, But what infuriates me, and I think you touched on this a little bit earlier before we got into the story, he calls police. They don't allow him to report Timothy as a missing child because Amy is a legal custodial parent and I think even after he provided the information where he was like, you don't understand, like, I just found all of her her pill bottles. They're completely full. She's off her medication. They just convince him, and they, like, calm his nerves, and they're like, honestly, she's probably upset. Maybe she took him on, like, a quick weekend trip or something just to get away, and she's just upset with you. Wait 24 hours before we file the report, which he does. And those first 24 hours could have been vital to capturing them. I feel like this is a topic for another time, but I still really think that the whole process around filing for missing persons needs to be revisited. Um, Agreed. Agreed. (laughs) Because it's so infuriating for the people that I understand the need for it because you don't, uh, so many people are found within the first 24 hours and you don't want to have, you know, police forces uh, off on wild goose chases when their efforts could be used otherwise. But how many times do we hear about this? Like how many times does this have to happen before we revisit this 
policy. I mean... Especially when it comes to minors. I mean, everything should be off the table when it comes to kids that go missing. There should yeah. be no 24-hour hold period. I, I agree. If a child has been abducted, or you're suspecting they've been abducted, especially by someone who you've confirmed is off their medication, maybe you should get in a car. May, like, maybe, yeah. like, police should get in a car and go look around, make some calls. Absolutely. Or even if it's, like... Because I think the reasoning behind it is there's other things they have to worry about then why don't we develop some other kind of sector of the police force that's specifically designed to, like, go after these types of um, right. cases? I mean, there was valuable time lost here that I think, I, like like I'm saying, the story is it's not unique in that way because we've seen this so many times, which is probably why we're sharing the frustration because mm-hmm. kids go missing or people go missing and police... I mean, I'm thinking of my Therese Richardson right now, which mm-hmm. is so upsetting, like... A woman, you, you don't know that story, but we'll cover it on another podcast, but she was a woman who was arrested, clearly suffering, like, a sense of psychosis in public. Um, and her mother had called the police station, and she was like, I'm, like, more than two hours away. Please keep her in your custody. I just want to confirm she'll be in your custody until I can come pick her up tomorrow. And they confirmed. They're like, yep, she'll be here. By midnight, they, they rule that she's fine, and they just release her without her phone or her wallet or a pickup. So she's just a woman experiencing psychosis who they just released to the woods. Mm. Even after they had confirmed with the mother that she <laughs> she wouldn't be released. So then the mother calls again and she's infuriated and she's, you know, trying to convey to them. She was like, the seriousness of this, like, you have to, we have to go look for her. Like, she's, she has, knows nobody out there and like, she has no phone or like, she could be in danger. And they're mm-hmm. like, let's wait 24 hours. No, don't wait 24 hours. Like... I really don't understand. Uh, I they they really should try to revisit that policy sooner they, rather yeah. than like it's just <laughs> it's well it, it really bugs the crap out of me. I know, I know. Well, I mean, these police. So what they eventually do with James in this case is that they they run through all of the rational parts of the story, and they're like, listen, Amy has no history of violence. She has no criminal record that we can pull up. She's a custodial parent. You. Uh, clearly, she was trusted enough by the school to have her son released to her, so we should just cool off and wait this out. But by the following morning, he's still unnerved. James gets up and he contacts the Aurora Police Department again because he cannot ignore that his child is missing, he can't get in contact with Amy, and he has no idea where they went. He has no idea what her intentions are. So they he goes to work that day and police arrive to his place of work where they help him fill out the first missing persons report for Timothy and that's when he provides a photo to them of Amy and Timothy that he happens to have in his wallet by the following day this is when we finally hear from Amy for the first time we finally get word from her she calls her mother now it's not entirely clear what exactly she said on that conversation. But what she did do was she assured her mother that everything is fine. Because at this point, the whole side of Amy's family, they know that she's been missing or they know that she's at least like skipped town with Timothy. But she calls her mother and she says, I'm fine. Timothy's fine. We are both okay. We just needed a little space. So I took him out on this kind of like impromptu trip. And it's kind of shaping up that it's like a mother-son weekend vacation, right? A little Mm -hmm. harmless. And she's so seemingly fine and convincing on the phone that it puts the mother at ease. But then Amy goes a step further. She calls James's brother, but not James. And the brother, on the other hand, he he senses something's a little bit wrong with her. There's something off with, with Amy. She's on the phone, and again, she's doing the same thing. She's trying to convince him. She's like, we're both okay. We're just on the road. We're going to be back in a couple of days. In the background, he can hear Timothy. So we know that Timothy was with her. We know that Timothy was alive. But he can hear him repeatedly saying, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Which really unnerves him. And there's one final, like, closer to this conversation between Amy and James's brother uh, that really kind of shakes him, where he's kind of trying to convince her. He's like, you know... You, you really have to call James. Like, at least just give him a call to, like, let him know where you are. It's fine if you're taking some space, if you took him on a little trip, but, like, you gotta let him know. And she says, Timothy is my son. I can do what I want. And I think she actually bookends that, and she goes, um, Timothy belongs to me. Hangs up the phone. <sighs> In the context of the full story, it's a little chilling, no? 
Oh, gosh, it's so chilling. Because up until this point, you're thinking... I mean, obviously, it's unsettling from the beginning, right? I mean, she's lied to the school, but you think that this is not going to go where it goes. Um, and for no, me... Sh- I was shocked. I was the story. shocked. I was shocked. I was shocked. But after hearing um, that that was kind of the final word, like, to me, that's very much a, a turning point in this whole story. Like, it almost feels like the moment that she kind of, like, made up her mind, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that she was going to follow through with the plan. Yeah. Yeah, a deliver a deliverance of... I don't know, confirmation in some way that she was like, he doesn't belong to James kind of thing. And I'm yeah. going to make sure of that. Yeah, because it almost f- felt like when I was reading about it that the calls to her mom, the calls to someone else in the family, not her husband, the brother, it's mm-hmm. kind of like convincing yourself you're okay and you're not. And when somebody kind of like calls you out for it, like her brother-in-law did, mm-hmm. it. I think is a trigger that like, yes, she yes. knows something it isn't right with herself. And she's like, okay, but whatever I'm going through with this, it's, it's over. It's done. Like, I know I'm, I, I've lost the plot sort of. I just got chills down my spine. No, you're right. I think what, what we were witnessing or what these calls were about was a lot of masking, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, the second that he says something that kind of triggers the whole reason why this, this plan is unfolding. That's when, yeah, it becomes a little too real for her because she knows what she's doing mm-hmm. is off. She knows mm-hmm. what she's doing is dark. But James's brother, he relays this information back to James. Um, and it's all still concerning. Um, but this does kind of put his mind at ease because at least now he knows. He was like, all right, Amy's mad at me. She doesn't want to talk to me. But at least I know where she is, that they're like on this trip. They're going to be back in a couple of days. And I know that Timothy's fine, but he's still just kind of upset. He was like, you know, I should have been clued in on this, that, that he's my kid too. He continues to call repeatedly, trying to get in touch with Amy, but he would never get through. Now, by the following morning, this is now May 14th, so I think we're like three days into this. James wakes up, and he has a knock at his door, which he goes to answer, and it's the Aurora Police Department. They come in, and they sit him down, and they inform him of something. They've just found Amy in another part of Illinois, and she's dead. And Timothy's whereabouts is un known when i got to that Stu, that's when my i shot up out of bed and i was like whoa i was like i gotta go get a glass of water i know i know i have full body chills even though i've read this you know dozens of times at this point i still get chills every time yeah it's it's really difficult to like wrap your mind around it but i want to run through like a bit of the reconstruction of the timeline to explain to everybody like what happened Because at this point, we just really know what was going on on the other side of the family. We know what James was experiencing, all his his dealings with the police, the brother, the mother. So what was Amy doing during those, those two days? So the case is shocking. Police immediately launch this widespread investigation. They're piecing together all of those final days of this, like, impromptu road trip. And they comb through credit card statements, phone records. They're looking at surveillance footage. They're looking at tracking data from the tolls pass that was in her car, which is really interesting. Anything they can to kind of reconstruct the timeline of where she went and what happened. So what we know is that the morning that James dropped Timothy off at school and then he drops Amy off at work at um, the property management uh, firm, Mm -hmm. Amy never stepped foot into that office. It was like she walked through the parking lot and then immediately turned around and walked back to their home, which was pretty close, um... And then she picked up the family car, the other family car, drives to Timothy's school. So then we catch the surveillance footage where she walks in at 8.15 and she says, I have to have Timothy pulled from classes. There's an emergency. Directly from the school, Amy then drove almost an hour and a half headed east before she stopped at an auto repair shop in LaGrange, Illinois. And we know this from credit card receipts as well as some witness statements And we would also learn from security footage that on this first day, I believe Amy Amy took Timothy to the zoo um, while her car was getting worked on. And then they would eventually head over to a water resort where they spend the night. And this is all like 65 miles away from the hometown. And we still have no explanation as to why she went so far or what her intentions were at this point. So then by the following morning, they, they, they get back in the car. They go even further. 
Um, we know this from other receipts um, because she stopped at several gas stations and she also stopped at a convenience store where she bought Timothy clothes, a craft kit, as well as a toy car. And then they head four hours away from Aurora. And that night, they would also check into another water resort, I think, where they are both seen the following morning um, leaving that resort at 10 a.m. on camera. This footage is really important to the case. It's May 13th, 10 a.m. They're walking out the exit, and it is the last time that Timothy and Amy are ever seen on camera together. So then this is where the timeline gets really interesting to me because we we then have the off the grid moment, right? So Mm -hmm. then she gets back in her car, 10 a.m., a couple of hours pass, and we're now rolling around to like noon, 1230. Amy makes a phone call, the phone call to her mother, and then she calls James's brother like we talked about. So at that point, we know that Timothy was still with her. He's still alive by 1230. What really shocked me about this research, I I pray that you read this because it was blowing my mind. Um, When they peeled through all of her phone records, Amy had actually tried to call James twice. What? No, I didn't. Yes, yes. (gasps) So this, yeah, that that really threw a wrench in like my, my mental timeline. She had tried to call James twice, but for whatever reason... Those calls never connected. Maybe it was like a service issue or something. But we're never going to know like what those calls would have been about, what she would have said, how that would have affected the timeline here. Like, we're just never going to know what her intentions were. Well, and, and those calls Timmy happened a little closer to two. If he could yeah, have yeah. possibly remained alive, intercepted this. Yeah. <sighs> wow, I did it just not made read such that. An in- yeah, it's such an interesting picture into the context of everything that we know that she did and about the story, their relationship. I was like, that's that's wild. And what are the chances to be like, just you happen to do that in a place where the calls... I mean, she tried twice. The calls just don't connect. I thought it was wild. But we also know from that final call, which again was a little closer to two, where that call was made. It was Sterling, Illinois, which this is also interesting, is only 80 miles from Aurora. So at that point, she was driving back to Aurora. She was closer. So why did she go four hours away just to drive back to eventually kill, hide, or do something with Timothy? I mean, well, I wonder if she had researched prior, like, water parks or whatever that she wanted to take him to. I mean, I can't imagine there's a ton of fun parks or water parks around where they lived if it's a pretty... Oh, I guess so, yeah. You know, I, I mean, that's that's what I was thinking. Or could it have been that she was contemplating where the heck she was going to commit what she eventually does and was just kind of mm-hmm. playing it by ear? I don't know. No, I agree. I I, I guess that would make sense if she's, she's sort of constructing, like, his his last few days with her and she's making them as special as she can. But those parks and those locations happen to be further out than where her eventual drop-off location is for him. Mm -hmm. But by 2 p.m., we know that Amy turned off her cell phone and she left it on the side of the road. And she did so so that she would not be tracked. The foresight of that is really interesting to me because knowing the full story, she did that knowing that her phone would be tracked and her pings would be tracked even after she was dead. She's plotting beyond her own death, which is really fascinating to me. The following six hours after she leaves that phone on the side of the road, her whereabouts is unknown. She goes completely off the grid, um, and it is very possible that within this window, whatever she did with Timothy, this is when it happened. Because the next time that we see Amy, we roll around to 7.25 p.m., and she's caught on the security cameras walking into a dollar store in Winnebago, Illinois, This is the first time that we see Amy on camera alone. So when she had her cell phone at 2 p.m., Timothy was with her. Six hours pass, Timothy is gone. The question is, where did she take him? What did she do with him? And one thing I'm going to call out because I didn't want to forget it. When they catch her on this 7.25 p.m. footage, she's wearing a different outfit from Mm -hmm. what she wore in the 10 a.m. footage when she was exiting the resort with Timothy. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean... Blood? That's what I thought. I I mean, if I had to speculate, I... I I don't know. I'm, I'm so careful to not 
I, I really want to catch myself um, about making like blanket statements about what I think. But in this case, my gut just feels that that Timothy was gone by this point. Um, it's mm-hmm. certainly the most logical conclusion. So I would think that probably changed her outfit because something had gone down. I thought that too. I was like, it has to be blood or it could be dirt, Mm -hmm. um, which I immediately thought I'm like from burial or maybe just being in like a rural area. If you're like trekking through the woods or something, Mm -hmm. because you have to get to some place that's off the grid. Mm -hmm. So what we know after we catch her on the security footage, she then heads over to a grocery store where she would buy writing supplies and then makes her way eight miles over to Rockford, Illinois, where she checks into a nearby hotel. Then by the following afternoon, sometime roughly after 12, housekeeping would enter her room where they find that Amy had taken her own life. Um, It wasn't immediately obvious, I think, when police got there how she had done it, but then they quickly find medication that she had overdosed on as well as some pretty significant slash marks that she had made along her wrists as well as her neck using a box cutter. But again, she's found in this room alone. Neither Timothy nor any of his belongings were ever found with her. We just don't know where they went. So police are kind of, you know, they're combing through the room. They're looking through things for clues. um, And they do find Amy's final note, which she had intentionally left on a piece of paper right next to her body, kind of crafting her goodbyes. She had reportedly written three letters, um, but the details of all of them are pretty murky because I don't think they've ever publicly released those letters. They've only released snippets of like her sentiments and her final, her final words. But One was intended to be found near her body. The other two were sent to her mother and I think to her friend who she had gone on that trip to the Bahamas with. Um, Like I said, neither of them have released anything publicly about those, except for I think the mother. She either read or provided a passage from Amy's final note to her, which I wanted to read to you because I think this gives the clearest window into Amy's headspace and it's in her own words. So it's really Mm -hmm. important. So she reads, or her note reads as follows. I have always felt apart from everything. Tim helped with that for a while, and maybe if Jim and I had been better, it would have been okay. But everything just fell apart, and this time there were too many pieces to pick up again. I can't take the chance of Jim hurting Tim because of my choices, so I've taken him somewhere safe. He will be well cared for. He says he loves you. Now, like I said... We find the absence of the clothes, the toys, the backpack. Nothing of Timothy's has ever been found. Um, And a lot of people have speculated on what she means by he will be safe, he will be well cared for. Because what was found in her note, which was really interesting, her, her personal goodbye that was found by the body, she mentions that as well. Timothy has been safe, or he's been placed safe with people who will care for him. But he will never be found. That has really that has really been the most interesting staple to this case. The certainty in the delivery of knowing that wherever he is, she is certain, certain that he will never be found. Well, and the other part of it is that it's so it's, it's contradictory, right? Because she's saying that she's she's well, actually, hold on. Does she say that she's like I felt like I had read somewhere that maybe she says um, something along the lines of being sorry that it, this had to happen or that. Yeah. She, okay. she apologizes for the whole mess that she'd created. Yes. Yes. Apologizing for the mess she created. So it's contradictory because it's like, she's apologizing for leaving this behind and then saying that he will never be found feels very, um, vindictive to me. Like, mm-hmm. and the, the underbelly of it for me, just translating in my mind what that kind of meant was like, if nobody can be with him, if I can't be with him, nobody can be with him. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Well, she also d- kind of deliberately frames James in this as well. To yes, be yes. kind of an abuser because yes. I can't take the chance of James. She refers to him as Jim as his nickname. But like she says, I can't take the chance of him hurting Tim for the choices I've made. Uncertain if the, those choices happen to do with their marriage falling apart or if they would happen to, they happen to do with her suicide. We're not certain on that. Um there's a lot of decoding to, to her final words. Yeah. It can go quite a few different ways. And again, I, it kind of, to me, goes back to the convincing yourself that you're doing the right thing almost. Writing that part about Jim in there, it just, 
I, I feel like that's not wholly accurate. Like there's just something in my gut that just feels like that's not that that's not the full picture of what was going on or what was going yeah. down. Yeah. We would later get some statements, I think, from Amy's side of the family when they talk about James, Jim, and, you know, they're talking about what she said and whether or not they believe it, um, which I'll get into in some of the theories. But in the immediate aftermath of this, in the investigation, police are like, if we have these notes and we have a missing child, we have to turn over, you know, every every piece of evidence we have. So they immediately switch over to the car, Amy's car, which was found in the parking lot, and they find a couple of chilling details here. For one, her tires are caked in a type of, like, soil-gravel combination, which is suggested, um, or it's suggested to investigators at the time, that during those six hours that Amy was off the grid, she went off-road at some point. You know, deep into the woods or maybe into a farmland or field, she went somewhere that was heavily removed from any of the towns or the suburbs, either to hide a body or to give Timothy away. Now, what shocked them about this car was when they look in the back seat they find blood. Now, the blood would be tested, and it is positively identified as Timothy's, which, for a lot of people, they were like, this is a closed case. I mean, he was most definitely killed. If we're talking about, like, a missing child, and we're, you know, she was the last person with him, there's blood found in the back seat, how could you not go there? However, it's not immediate cause for assumption that Timothy was murdered by his mother because the family kind of dispels this. They come forward saying... He was a frequent sufferer of nosebleeds, and that actually could have been an old stain. It could have been there for a while. So that's kind of put on the back burner, and then they turn their attention back to the soil. The soil and the gravel that was found on her tires. Now, this provides more information for forensic scientists, because they can tell that she most likely pulled off of a gravel shoulder and then backed her car into a field. I was amazed that they were able to like determine this from, like, the soil itself and also the, like the deliberate like layering of the gravel and the soil to figure yeah. out like what was the sequence of the drive, but also the direction that like the imprint of the soil that was made on her tires. It was so interesting to me. And that soil, it's typically seen in the north central or northwest Illinois area, which is a massive clue that Amy of where Amy went during those six hours, those six unknown hours. However, they can't get more specific than that. That's about as like narrow as we can go. I mean, I, the best... Oh, sorry. What were you going to say? No, I was... You keep going. You keep going. I was just going to button it up and just say that at this point, the best lead is to follow like where her final phone call was, which was, I think, Sterling, before she left her phone on the side of the road. And then at this point in the investigation, police, 70 plus volunteers, they they would spend the next week just going through every avenue of like fields, abandoned homes, farmland, Cities are plastered with flyers of Timothy's face. They bring in bloodhounds. There is no lead on where she brought him or what she did. So that I was just going to button up. That's the end of what happened. And then I was going to get into, like, the press and the investigation on this. What were you going to say? I, I was going to say I had the same exact thought when I was reading about, like, them finding the grass and, like, the whatever, the different types yeah. of gravel and the tire treads. Like, it's that is something that I feel like someone that, has premeditated a plan, which it kind of seems mm-hmm. like she did, um, that I, I just, she didn't think about that. And I mean, I guess she got kind of lucky in this case, um, that they weren't able to uncover even more, but that, that I felt after I read that, I was like, okay, they're getting close. They're getting really close. Like those are pretty significant clues and how amazing that they can figure that out. I, I know I'd never even heard of forensic science like that, where they can they can basically pinpoint where soil came from yeah. geographically. That is really interesting to me. Yeah, it's and still a wide. I mean, it's a wide radius, but like the northwest of Illinois. That's I mean, you're narrowing totally. And like I read about like the type of grass that they like were able to uncover. It was very clearly a type of tall grass that would grow like in only certain sections of the state. And um, I was just like. Uh, same exact thought. I was like, this is just fascinating that they can um, determine that from a vehicle. But it's it's also confusing, don't you think? Because, like, if they can pinpoint, like, if this comes from, like, this specific set of fields, right, that has this type of soil, it's in this area, it has this type of tall grass, and they comb over it with all of these volunteers and with bloodhounds and a canine unit, and they still can't find any trace of him. Yeah. What the hell happened to him? I know. I I just, I can't wrap my mind around that. But as you can imagine, this story is huge news 
in the aftermath of it, the press coverage in the following weeks is brutal. I mean, the headline is shocking. And there's a mother dead. We've got a son who's hidden somewhere. It's unknown whether he's alive or dead. But this is when a lot of, like, the backstory details of Amy's life kind of get dragged out in the media. So, of course, like I said, we we know that Amy struggled with her mental health. But for greater context, her sister comes forward and she shares that Amy had a particularly difficult childhood where Amy was routinely hurt by their father. I don't know if that suggests sexual assault or if it was just physical or emotional abuse, but she did mention that. And because of this, Amy had suffered with lifelong issues battling depression and anxiety and by the time she was married to James like you said this had been her fourth marriage she was divorced three times prior and I I think after Timothy was born and then their marriage started to go south this was like a new low for her Mm -hmm. to know that like it's happening again it's happening all over again like she says everything fell apart and there were just too many pieces to pick up But we also learned that they ran into, like, some financial troubles at one point. And James also found texts on Amy's phone between her and her first husband insinuating that she had plans to meet up with him. And he had confronted her about this, like, maybe a year or two prior when they started having problems. And she had, like, crafted this. This also leads into, like, her as, like, a secretive planner. But she had crafted this plan to meet up with the first husband and coordinated it when James would be out of town. So he finds those texts Mm -hmm. and he's pretty far removed, even at that point from the relationship. And he's unsure whether or not he actually wants to divorce, but he just made it very clear to her. He was like, if we divorce, I will pursue you in court for full custody of Timothy. And he would most likely win given Amy's lengthy battle with mental illness, as well as a previous suicide attempt from years and years prior. Mm -hmm. And she was institutionalized for that. So she knows She doesn't have a a great leg to stand on in court, but losing Timothy would be unimaginable for her. Yeah, and I mean, it's a very logical motive as to why someone would kill their own child, which is just so tragic to even think about. But, I mean, with that history and that context, I mean, it's this would be one thing if it was just out of the blue, But it's clear that we had signs pointing towards beyond even just like mental health. I mean, the the whole context of like the text messages about the custody battle that could happen, like Mm -hmm. very, very clearly we have a a place that we can logically start to draw from. I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's I, I think for someone like Amy, who, as she described in her own words, she found having Timothy and him being her only solace for sort of keeping her sanity and keeping her on the ground, it was just unfathomable to think that if I get divorced, I will lose him. And you kind of hit the nail on the head earlier when you said, if I can't have him, no one can mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, but then they, they turned their attention back to the letter that Amy had wrote to her mother, where she says, I don't want James to hurt Timothy. So we should talk about that too, because police did fail to find any evidence that James was abusive. Um, and obviously our impression of him on television, his interviews, that's all just circumstantial to how he was presented in that moment, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But even Amy's sister has come forward and she also believes that Amy wrote that sort of maliciously with the intent to frame James as an abusive father. Is that sort of where you're siding to? Yes. And I also just think it's so statistically, I was trying to read about um, people killing their own children and, I feel like normally it's not the mother. And so mm-hmm. already like my my the hairs are raised on the back of my neck because I just mm-hmm. think it's really chilling and disturbing and like unlikely normally that the mom actually kills a child. So I feel like there would have to be like extreme kind of like uh, imbalances and like motivations behind that to happen. So it, it to me if I'm thinking about it in that way, it, yeah, I, I side on the, or I, uh, side on the, the theory that she probably was doing this maliciously and vindictively, unfortunately. Yeah. I hate it to say that. It might have been the perfect storm. No, I mean, yeah. like, it might have been the perfect storm with, I mean, if we're talking about a chemical imbalance in the brain, which we know Amy was most like, most likely experiencing some sense of psychosis or a breakdown, a sense of mania. Um, I mean, she may not have been in full control of her thoughts, We've seen that story time and time again, especially with mothers who kill their children. 
Um, I'm just perplexed by some of <laughs> some of the the evidence that comes up later, or I guess the lack thereof mm-hmm. as to what really happened to Timothy, because I really, really have this this odd feeling. I'm like, if he was out there somewhere, especially a missing child who's suspected of being killed, I, I'm really having a hard time understanding how he hasn't been found yet. But we also get some like anecdotal evidence here. Maybe that like contrasts with my theory. Um, this is from the mother or basically all of Amy's family where they mentioned that she's not a lax person. Like she was a meticulous planner and she would fully execute um, any operation or anything that was like this, leaving no stone unturned. So police kind of pried through her personal computer or actually three of them. She has three computers, um, all of her accounts. They glean any details they can on what her plan was. Um, where she eventually brought Timothy. They just, they still have no way to trace her. They have no way to know what she was doing, but what they do find, despite not finding, you know, any evidence of the plan, they find an email address of hers that nobody knew about. They were never able to crack into it. It was encrypted. However, it's largely suspected that that email alias was used to coordinate and hide the majority of her plan, which according to driving records, she had done the trip out there twice before. And this is, there's evidence that she was planning this for up to six months in advance. Now, I have to pause and I have to talk about that because I have, I mean, I guess we can get into it in the theories, but this is why it's suggesting to me that there was someone else involved. This is not a cut and dry case of like she took her son out, found a place to hide the body and killed him and then left him. Because if so, to plan that, you wouldn't necessarily need to do it in an email so much as you could do it in like an encrypted like notes app or like a secret journal or something felt to me like she was coordinating with someone. Yeah, I guess, but I, I, I don't know. For There's a part of me that thinks she was coordinating maybe the travel plans or like maybe uh, the... Because the, didn't she get her vehicle repaired somewhere? Like, I could kind of see it that way, but I feel like if you are having to find someone that's going to be a confidant of yours that's going to be your co-conspirator... To execute that over email, I feel like would be so easily, like, I I guess, personally, I would feel really um, unsettled about the idea of it being found out. Like, I feel like email, yeah, like, what's the phrase? It's like, say it, forget it, write it, regret it. Like, I feel like anything in writing is going to be, it's it's more easily uncovered than it is if you say it over the phone. So, like, Mm -hmm. if it were me... Um, like, wouldn't you just get like a burner phone or something and like connect with that person that way? Well, there, there are a few theories that like whoever she was in contact with was not somebody who was new to her, but an old contact, which is really interesting. I'll get into this in a little bit, but I also, there hasn't been clarity. I I've just seen it listed as an encrypted email and that could mean a couple of things. It may not necessarily be like a Gmail that they can't just like crack the password to. There are some encrypted email services out there that I was researching where they're impossible. They are designed for secret messaging like this. Like there's like Telegram, um, there's a version of WhatsApp, but like they're so heavily encrypted um, and their messages are set to sort of like disappear after like 24 hours that like they're designed to concoct plans like this. I think historically they're mostly used for like drug trafficking and things like that to keep like like no trace in writing. Yeah. Um, but by 2011, I don't think it would be off the table to assume that like in her planning of this, she might've investigated using one of those apps or like one of those, um, email services to communicate with someone. Yeah. And I mean, back then, like technology was not as robust as it is obviously today. So maybe, maybe it really would have been extremely difficult to get into any of those. Yeah, I mean they're they're pretty well encrypted. I think they go through like quite a few quite a few um, digital hoops to make sure that those messages are kind of protected or lost forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but outside of that, I mean, we have no other immediate leads or breaks in the case. And James eventually leaves Aurora within the year. He can't stay in that town. He goes back to his hometown in Iowa. But then I have to talk to you about the part of this story where I almost projectile vomited when like <laughs> suddenly eight years later. After the disappearance, a call comes in to a Kentucky police department with reports of a young man, possibly a teenager, running through traffic. So this is in Newport, Kentucky. It's 2019. 
reports of a young man, teenage years, seen pacing through an intersection. He approaches a car. He begs a woman, please call for help. I've just escaped a kidnapping. And she says, okay, who are you? What is your name? He goes, my name is Timothy Pitson. Tell me when you read that or heard that that you <laughs> didn't shit a brick. This like, made me so damn mad. This I know, made me I know. So mad. I I went full Nancy Grace in this moment, and I was like, <laughs> "This young man." In my head, I was just like, "The audacity of this young man." Um, just oh my god, I don't know what runs through someone's brain to. I know. I guess we, do we should that. reveal it. We have to reveal it for them, though. They yeah. may not know it. Oh, well, the story. Sorry. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, this, I mean, it's. A, the sensation of that, to think that, like, Timothy Pitson has been found alive is insane. Like, there's a huge media story because everyone wants to believe it. They contact the family. They contact the sister, Kara. And they're already jumping on because they're, he's, like, kind of fits the age. He kind of looks like him. He has a round face, brown hair, brown eyes. So they're already planning. They were like, what are we going to do when he comes home? Like, we have to get a bed ready for him. What will he need? They're, they're planning as if they're assuming that this is him. He's been found alive. So they take him to a hospital, police. And they're trying to interview him, get more information about the captors, about what had happened to him. They're starting to become increasingly suspicious that something's wrong with him. He seems to carry himself like a little bit older, and Timothy would have been 14 at the time. And he's also having some trouble recalling like certain details about the childhood and about the day he disappeared. So they're like, all right, let's, um, let's get a DNA test here and confirm that you're related to the Pitsons. He is in no way, shape, or form related to the Pitsons. He is later identified as Brian Reaney, who was a 23-year-old well-known scammer in the U.S. who had this history of impersonating teenagers, but particularly victims of trafficking. What a letdown. Oh, my gosh. And don't you just feel so much for the dad like or I, w- I wish they hadn't I wish they hadn't told them until I know I know I DNA really test. it see okay doesn't it baffle you that they don't have some policy about vetting for a boy that might not be who he says he is but they don't go after someone in 24 hours if they've gone missing like can we please reconcile these two policies and reverse them we will be on the committee as of next year <laughs> Literally, no, you, I me, agree, and Nancy are writing a bill, and we're taking it. <laughs> we're going to march our asses straight up to Capitol Hill, okay? I, I'll, I'll come visit for a week, honey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, the, as you're right, though, like, the news of this is really devastating for the family because they had really not only gotten their hopes up, but I think when you, you hear news like that, you, your mind sort of, you suspend your disbelief, and your mind puts out some of the obvious questions of, like, wait a second, how is this possible? Like... This doesn't make any sense. Like, you just put all the nonsensical stuff on the back burner because you want to believe beyond everything else that, like, it could be true, you know? Yeah. I, th- I think everybody's experienced, like, something like that. Or it's, I mean, this was all, like, a mistake to assume that he was dead all this time. But that happens. It is a massive letdown for the family. And to this day, we are left with what really happened to Timothy. It remains an unknown. And although there is a lot of evidence to support that Timothy is no longer alive, James, the father, still holds out hope, and he trusts, he really trusts, knowing everything and having gone through this, that although his wife was experiencing uh, the sense of mania, she would never harm their child, and that Timothy is out there somewhere living with people off the grid, because if he was dead, he would have been turned up by now. That's his thought. So that's everything we know, and then I can jump into maybe like the top three theories, but... Any final thoughts on the chaos of that case? That is a that's a really really wild. It is one. a wild, 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 old, wild one. <laughs> case. Um, yeah, I just what a what a awful like button of to put on that case that it it was Sorry. a hoax. No, 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 yeah. no, no. I'm saying like for the for the dad and I went and I watched that. Um, uh, video clip I was referencing about his demeanor earlier. In the same clip, he says, mm-hmm. "You know, I I believe that Timmy is out there somewhere. Hopefully, he's he's just been homeschooled all these years yeah, and whatever." Yeah. And I was just like, "Oh my gosh!" Like my heart was just like breaking. And also, it is really what an exercise because I, I feel like we're talking a lot about like mental health. Like what mm-hmm. an exercise and like your mental state like as the dad to like have to wake up every day and kind of like convince yourself or hold out hope or like suspend 
your disbelief enough to like you know think that your son is still alive i mean i hope i hope he is but i mean it's of course yeah. it's just such a it's it's just ugh, it's awful you kind of have to, yeah you kind of have to i guess when yeah. you're in that position i mean it's it's the same thing as um it feels really good to think about an afterlife that's kind of mm-hmm. what i like in this too it's yeah. really, it feels really good because we don't have all the answers on timothy to imagine that maybe he is just living with people off the grid and maybe he's he's 14 or actually i'm not sure how old he would be now he'd probably be closer to 18 mm-hmm. yeah maybe he is just living with people and he's just never he hasn't seen contact with the outside world since i mean yeah. it's it's certainly far-fetched it's certainly horrific in and of itself but it's probably the easier thought for james at this point he lost everything in a matter of days yep well with that let's get into that theory then because The first theory I want to cover is that Timothy is alive and that he lives off the grid. Now, many have stood by the theory that although Amy suffered from depression and eventually took her own life, she had no intentions to harm Timothy, her family. They've also suggested that because she was such a detail-oriented planner, she had researched privately and knew how to cover her tracks, which was clearly evident because she did. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, leaving her phone on the side of the road so they couldn't trace her using an alias email. And she was able to coordinate with coordinate all of this. Um, or at least with somebody that she deemed to be trustworthy over the course of six months when she was planning this to figure out a plan of like, how can I bring Timothy to them and do it without being traced, do it off the grid and keep off everyone's radar, but also make sure that I'm placing him with someone who's, so ingrained in this plan that I am sure he will never be found as long as he's with these people. So many have cited the blood. They've talked about the blood in the backseat being clear evidence that Timothy was murdered. However, the forensic scientists who have investigated that, they think it's possible that, like I said, it had been there for a while. And that's kind of in tandem with this anecdotal evidence that we have from the family saying that Timothy had nosebleeds frequently. So that's kind of ruled out off the bat. They're like, that's probably just old blood. There's no evidence to support that she had killed him. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if Amy did bring Timothy to some group of people off the grid, how did she find them? And how did she learn to trust them? And how is it possible that they have kept him a secret for more than a decade? Let's see. There are some people that have suggested that because of his enrollment age, um, I don't know how you'll side with this, but because of his like age being five or six at the time, he was right around the time when you would be enrolled in school. So people have suggested, like, what if he was dropped off with a family that was willing to take him in secret, but they were able to change his appearance from a young age, move him to, like, a very rural town somewhere else in America, and then just enroll him with, like, a faulty birth certificate or, like, a faulty name, right? And he just started, like, kindergarten as a totally new person. I find that incredibly far-fetched because I do think there was enough media coverage on this that somebody would have recognized him by now. Mm -hmm. But also when you're six, you're young, but you're, you're aware enough and have like a sense of identity enough to attach yourself to your parents and your name and who you are. I just find it hard that like even he could just reassimilate into a new identity. Exactly. I mean, for me, it's pretty... I, I I have a really hard time trying to convince myself that that's a plausible theory. I think when you're six years old and you've just been with your mom on like this amazing trip to the yeah. water parks and whatever, like to think that she was still, um, or to think if he were still alive at that point, that he wouldn't be saying to these people like, you're not my parents or that's not my name or like, you yeah, know, like he wouldn't just, tell like kids at school. Tell yeah. Teacher. Yeah. Like, so, like I just, I have a really hard time believing that. I agree. Yeah. I don't know if I can, I mean, I can certainly like consider the theory that he could be, he could have been placed with some people. I just don't know if I believe the theory that he had been placed with people who intended to like reframe his identity, but mm-hmm. that would lead us into the next theory that Timothy was killed. Now, Many people have analyzed the final letters that Amy wrote where she mentions that Timothy will be safe, but he will never be found. Her use of the word safe uh, is interesting here because it can mean many different things if we're talking about him being killed. I mean, safe could mean that he's safe in heaven uh, or just now that he's dead, he's safe from James and whatever she thought James would do to him. But also the deliberate use of the phrase, he will never be found. There's a sense of authority and certainty to that. That whatever she did with Timothy, his body would never be recovered, which to me suggests that she either hid the remains, 
I mean, so, so deeply that no one could ever possibly uncover them, or she destroyed the remains. So that, that beckons a whole other question. Um, now, if she did kill Timothy, we don't have a lot of evidence of the how or with what, um, or, you know, where she took the body. There's no, there are no clues left behind. I mean, Mm -hmm. we never found any purchase receipts or any history, uh, of Amy, like going to a store to buy stuff that you would normally, you would normally get to dispose of a body, right? Like trash bags, cleaning supplies, uh, acid, you know, like a shovel, you know, like she didn't purchase any of that. So if she did kill him, the question is how did she do it with what? And also, she has no history of violence, really. I mean, there, there is no history that she's a violent person who's capable of murdering a child. Did you read about antihistamines being found in her bloodstream? Uh, yes, I did. I think I did, yeah. So, oh, I was wondering, this is really, so go with me here. This is far-fetched. I'm, I'm here for the ride. <laughs> But I was thinking, I was like, okay, so if maybe she was trying to OD on antihistamines, is it possible Mm -hmm. that maybe she had given them to Timothy as well and, like, he had OD'd? Because if she doesn't have a history of violence, I kind of, like, and and it does appear, even though her thinking was really messed up at this point, I still think that that, like, instinctive part of, like, loving him and being a mother lived in her somewhere. Like, I don't really see her being super violent with his death, per se. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was thinking to myself, like, okay, what if she made him take these pills and he died, you know... She just put him to sleep. At least, yeah, put him to sleep. Yeah. And then I was thinking to myself, and this is where I get far-fetched, like, he kept saying, I guess, in that phone call that he was, like, hungry, and I wonder if, like, when you OD it's easier for that to like hit your bloodstream and kill you faster. If you're like not, if you haven't eaten and also like you wouldn't oh, yeah. throw up any of the pills after taking them. Maybe. I don't know. That's, that oh, is far fetched, so but I was like, no, 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 no. But I mean like, we haven't talked about like the intention of like him repeatedly saying he's hungry because kids, I mean, of course kids tell you when they're hungry. But yeah. But like, everybody says they're hungry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I guess that's yeah, why I was but, saying it's far fetched, but, um, I don't know. I kind of think, I, I feel like there's something there. I don't think that that's, that's as far-fetched as you think. That, like, there was some, like, intention behind her keeping him hungry that morning. Because here's what we know. They leave at 10 a.m. They directly left the resort. They did not stop at the resort's breakfast. So Timothy did not eat breakfast that morning. So I, th- and neither did she. And she also hmm. had the intentions that day to kill herself. Yeah. So maybe there is something to, like, ensuring that both of them were on an empty stomach. So huh. that nothing could kind of dilute. Um, oh, I didn't. I didn't know take. that they didn't eat at the resort. That's interesting. Okay, they did not. Yeah, they left immediately at ten, um, and then there is a two-hour gap where they're on the road. But I think it's soon that they were driving for a long period of time because you may not be hungry immediately in the morning, but by the time if you don't eat breakfast, by the time lunch rolls around, you would be hungry as a kid. You would at yeah, least like verbalize yeah. that. Totally. This is. I had not thought about this at all. You, you're sending me down a spiral right now. You need to be on Reddit. <laughs> you need to be on Reddit throwing these out. Oh like, my God. I, I need to start reading the Reddits because I know each time we cover one of these, you're always like, and Stu, the Reddit thread on this. And I'm like, why am I not on Reddit? Why did I not go to Reddit as much? Oh, because you think we're sleuths? Those I know. People, I, I've got I've to turn you on to like um, this YouTube channel. It's this guy. Uh, he's, he's just kind of like, um, I would describe him as like a very like nerdy, like to himself dude but he's really really ingrained in like doing i don't know how he has the sources to do this but like he does intense research on requested cases wow and he doesn't present it in like a theatrical like in a like a spooky way or anything like that where he's like the true crime story of he just gives a very even delivery and his videos are like four and a half hours long Stu. oh my god he did a video on missy beaver's I had to write to him because I was like, I'm sorry, but I you should be working for like a force or something. I have never seen someone who is able to deliver such intent research on this. And as like a non, as like non-law enforcement, yeah. a non-investigator, it was crazy the things he could dig up and the things he could like deduce. But anyway, so <laughs> back to this theory that Timothy was killed by the mother. I, I do think there's something to the idea of them not eating that day. That's really interesting, but... Still, we run into the issue of unless she truly destroyed those remains somehow, 
we just don't have any evidence and we don't have any evidence that you know she she purchased chemicals or anything that could do that we just don't know where he is um but i also do want to resurface and call to attention the outfit change between 10 to 7 25 p.m Mm -hmm. this to me suggested there was blood or dirt or something that had dirtied her clothes in the process of hiding timothy we just don't know so if we go with your theory that maybe she put him to sleep on an empty stomach with these pills um and then what does she do does she bury him and she's just covered in dirt. I mean, the rest of her wasn't dirty. Well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like... So to me, I think that burying him would make more sense because it's a little bit more ceremonial, I guess. Like if we're thinking about if she really still had that love for him, even though it's absolutely fucked. Um, I don't. I can't think of another word. Um, but no, if, fair. Yeah, like if if... I just, I don't know why, but I can't see her, like, destroying his body. Like, in this weird, imagine uh, the weird version of her that I've imagined, I could, like, see her burying his body. I've also wondered, I'm like, maybe we were thinking about this all wrong. Maybe it has to do with, like, the meticulous planning. And maybe Amy changed her outfit to throw leads off, you know, if, if she thought there was any chance she'd be caught on camera anymore. That's exactly what I was just thinking. I was just yeah. having that thought, because I think she probably knew that she was going to go to that store by the letters to write the, uh, by the pen and paper to write her letters. And at that point, she's like, I am not going to stay alive living with the guilt of just killing my son and getting, you know, burying him. I have to ensure that no one catches me so I can take care of my own death. Yeah. Yeah. That might, I, it's amazing. They were actually able to like, I don't know how people sit through surveillance footage and they, they like find people like that. Cause I know. she doesn't even look like herself in that video. I'm like, how could, how could you spot that? I know it's wild. Well, it is wild. Wild. <laughs> but that's, so that's the theory that Timothy was killed. I'm going to round us out and close us with this final theory, which I think is a bit interesting and maybe ties a firmer connection to the idea that Timothy was given to someone. So there are a lot of people on lines too on Reddit <laughs> who believe that there is some evidence here, um, which was confirmed by a distant relative of Amy's, that she has a former connection to a cult in Illinois. Now, now, now. What? Yes. So, (laughs) now, I do not, I, I do not think that there is enough evidence that can support this, that ever warranted some kind of, like, a search warrant or for them to investigate, like, any of the alleged cults. However... There is a family member that says that she had ties to a man or might have been in a, a previous relationship with a guy who belonged to this cult. It's a very well-known cult, I guess, in Illinois. So Amy had this secret email, um, which to me, to me clearly indicated that it was not just used as like a notes app. It was used maybe to communicate um, with someone. It was either used to communicate with like the resorts that she was planning with, although they never found any emails on their end that were linked back to this secret email address. So I don't know if I can side with that theory. I mean, do you think there's any possibility to that at all? Have you completely divorced any of this from your mind that Amy could have a connection to an outside party, like a cult? (laughs) I just wish you could have seen my face when you said (laughs) that she was (laughs) attached to a cult. My eyes, I don't think I've ever been bigger. Like (laughs) you threw me for a in loop with that like i did not think that's what was coming out of your mouth i had never heard that before ever and like i said i knew kind of the top line of the story but i had never heard the theory that like she had former connections to a cult and that could explain where she dropped him off do we know what the cult like like what was it about like what like okay okay so i do have some information so hold on i need a sip of diet coke (laughs) because i am on the ride now (laughs) i know well, I mean, this would this would explain this would tie off a lot of loose ends, right? So, there are a lot of people who have actually gone back to the tires, right, and the specific soil that was found on the tires that tied it to a very specific area. Now, it connected it to this general area in the northwest of Illinois. Within that massive radius, apparently, there is a fairly well known cult that does live somewhat off the grid. Although, like I said, there has never been sufficient evidence for law enforcement to track them down to question them. Um, it, it just kind of ties to 
to Amy in this way. So how does it tie to her? Let's see. People think that she had just plotted to give Timothy away to them. And this was like part of the six month pre like pre plan where she had touched base with them through email, explained that she was unhappy, explained that maybe even crafted the narrative even further to paint James as this monster. Because clearly she wanted that in a note that would most likely be publicized later that she was afraid James would hurt Timothy. Maybe that was to corroborate a story that she had fed this cult saying he's in an abusive household. I, I'm fearful that, you know, if I die or something happens to me, he'll just get custody. I can't turn him over to child services because James will pursue it legally. Whatever story she might have crafted to convince these people to take him in and keep him a secret because they're just as liable in like the illegality of all of this, right? Right. So, I mean, they're, they've got stake in it too in some way. Um, unless they have some sinister incentives for why they would want to take in a little boy. I'll let that rest. (laughs) Now, let's see. It's also supported that Amy had intentions to place him with people as opposed to just dumping a body because we know that she had made those previous trips to that area. I think the Sterling area um, or somewhere around there within six months. So it wasn't like she made trips to like the water parks or anything. Um, You know, she could have made trips to plot like where she was going to hide a body, but... I think maybe you could scope that out with one trip. I'm curious as to why you would go back twice, unless you're doing some of your dealings in person and having conversations, as opposed to writing. Like, the writing is getting too risky. Yeah. um, (laughs) I'm still reeling right now. (laughs) I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm, like, literally envisioning every cult leader that I've ever seen in any movie or, like, a docuseries and just, like... Mm -hmm creating this picture in my head of her driving out to meet them in like a rural area and like pre-planning it all together. Like I'm, my, I, I'm just baffled right now at the thought of this. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I should just say that. Oh. I mean, a lot of, a lot of this is, it exists as just an internet theory until one of her former relatives comes out of the woodworks and he's insisting that he knows when in like in her younger years, her twenties, she had connections to a cult. She was dating someone or she was seeing someone in the Dells area of Illinois. And people know that there is a church like cult out there. That's very similar to how the Amish live. Now I couldn't find any concrete evidence or articles detailing which cult this is by name, like nothing specific. Um, but it's suggested in the theory that she reached out to the old contact of the cult via email, because although I suppose maybe they're mostly living off the grid or, Amish, you can't see me quoting, but I'm quoting. Yes. <laughs> um, she had, she knew she would be able to reach this person somehow, and she did so secretively. And she feeds him the story, they orchestrate the plan, even up to her suicide, maybe, knowing that, like, she's a loose end for them. Because if they're assuming liability in this of the risk of taking on Timothy, they have to know that there's no possibility of her cracking under the pressure, of her being questioned. So... Maybe the suicide was part of the plot all along. And part of me sides with this theory, but I... I don't know if it's directly tied to Timothy being placed in a cult, per se, but I think it's very possible that she might have had a connection to a person or a group of people who had intentions to live in secret with him. Um, And with no trace of a body ever being found, I do find it very difficult that after 10 years, you know... There, there's also there's no credit card statements or surveillance confirmation that Amy had purchased anything that you would normally purchase to get rid of a body like that. So I have to assume he it's not off the table. He could be out there somewhere with a group of people. I mean, <laughs> I can hear that Diet Coke <laughs> I'm like, trickling down your lips, trickling down. Um, <laughs> I you know I I guess yeah I I could see, but I also wonder like if this is an Amish group or something. Wouldn't she have to kind of tell them that she's planning on killing herself? And do most religious groups think that that's okay? Not usually. Like well, they wouldn't. I mean, I cults are no strangers or to cults, suicide. I guess. Let's yeah. Start with oh, that. well, that's yeah. true. I guess I was going <laughs> off the th- idea if it's like an Amish group or something. Um, <sighs> a lot of cults like brand themselves as a church yeah. to stay under the radar too, because people generally leave them alone. The government leaves them alone. Um, that's a really good way to like keep off the grid, especially if you're doing some stuff behind the scenes. But here's like the taking other, in children. <laughs> but Silas, here's the other thing: is that 
wouldn't she have to know that this cult was completely removed from like technology and the world? Like, why would they be emailing? Well, that's what that's what I'm curious about too. I mean, it may not necessarily be. That's why I was putting quotes around Amish because I know the Amish are completely removed from all things modern, but it may not have been that scenario. But I think even within Amish communities, I watched a doc on Amish people. <laughs> um, of course, they you have did. like I did. Of course, <laughs> I did. Because uh, <laughs> why would it not? I found that like within their communities, they still have some people who like live on the fringes of their community who are like considered emergency people. So if there's an emergency where like someone has to be taken to a hospital or something, there are like some people who like still kind of live within the community. They're not like outcasts, but they're also not fully immersed. And they're like the ones who can drive. And they're like the ones who have like seen the city or Mm -hmm. they're like the ones who have like taken a plane. So they're not necessarily banished from the Amish, but they're also because they're kind of needed in that way. So I'm assuming maybe it's one of those type of people. Mm -hmm. Like most people don't use computers or they don't use the internet in any way, shape or form in this community. But maybe this one guy who has a bigger stance in this cult, who she knows does. I mean, I guess we have to honor any theory really at this point because he's never been found. I, uh, here's what I'm going to say. If we get a news story next week, and they Don't. say cult, <laughs> and they say cult ambushed by police. <laughs> Timothy Pitson found alive as an eighteen-year-old milking a cow. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm. I, I'm sorry. We have to make a little bit of like levity here because it's a no, very heavy absolutely. case for us to sit through. I was going to say I have a piece about that I could give us a little reprieve. <laughs> I was going to ask you: Do you remember on tour when we drove through Amish country? <gasps> Did we? Maybe Where? maybe it wasn't you. I, I was in the car with someone in Pennsylvania, and I had never seen oh Amish people before. Oh, it was Cheyenne. We were in the truck driving, and oh my God. Cheyenne almost went off the freaking road because we saw a horse and buggy being <gasps> driven by an Amish man on the side of the road. And I was like, am I hallucinating right now? Yeah, I would think that's an apparition. I'd be yeah. like, oh, I've time warped. <laughs> like, <laughs> I swear to God, Silas... Cheyenne was going like 80 miles an hour and we <laughs> were whipping it and like could have almost killed this poor Amish man driving his horse and buggy. Like I, because we were He just was crossing so... the actual road. That's what was happening. No, he was on the opposite side of the road, like oh, going gotcha. towards us. But we were coming around the curb so fast that I swear to God, we were about to like take part of his buggy off. Like we were. <laughs> oh my God. No, I don't remember the story. I kind of like vaguely remember maybe a piece of that, but oh, I wish I was there for it. Oh my, my gosh. And I had, a, I had an experience like that. Not quite with Amish people, but this is really weird. And I still have no explanation for this. So like when I was growing up, every, like as like a morning, like routine every morning, like my mom would take us to like the river. Cause we live so close to the Connecticut river. Yeah. Like just before school. So she would take like my brother and I, I think my sister wasn't even born yet. And we would just, like, park in front of the river, and we would, like, bring our breakfast with us, um, and we would just eat there, like, watching the water. There was one morning she took us there, and it was really foggy, like, kind of, like, horror movie foggy outside, and we Mm -hmm. pulled into the river anyway. And there is a full-on pirate ship. I'm not kidding, and I'm not saying, like, I'm not mixing this up in my mind. It was, like, a Pirates of the Caribbean pirate ship floating in the middle of the Connecticut River. And we were looking at this. We were like stunned. We're like, what the hell? <laughs> and it was, it was like stationary. Like it wasn't going, it wasn't sailing. It wasn't going any which way. It was like, it was perched within the fog. I can see this so clearly in my mind. And it, it was like, it truly was like, it was out of history. Like it looked like it was straight out of Pirates of the Caribbean. And I still have no explanation for like what the hell that ship was, where it came from. How a ship, it was so big too. I was like, how could a ship like that even dock in a river? It was enormous. Literally the curse of the Black Pearl in the Connecticut I- River. <laughs> 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 we just sat there, we ate our McDonald's hotcakes, and we didn't bat one eye. <laughs> oh my God. That's so funny. Oh, I want hotcakes right now. I was going to say, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, the fact that you just had hotcakes when I was unprepared. <laughs> Don't ever do that to me again. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I immediately have to go get McDonald's now. 
Oh, I remember you sharing your affinity for like biscuits. McDonald's oh my god, biscuits. biscuits and well, and Tommy. Tommy was trying to convince you. He was like, no. He was like, Stu. He was like, don't don't get a McDonald's biscuit. There are plenty of wonderful bakeries in this community where we can go and get a biscuit. And you just turned to him. And you go, Tommy. You don't get it. <laughs> you just just <laughs> missed him to the ground. You well, at like, that point, off. Like, <laughs> I was like, first of all. McDonald's biscuits. McDonald's breakfast food is elite. Like, let's just call it's it pretty what superior. It is. It's, it's superior. superior. And at that point, Tommy had lost any ability to pick anywhere we were going <laughs> to dine because every choice he made was unfortunately um, <laughs> pretty bad. Uh, the smoked fruit. <laughs> the liquid smoked stop, fruit. Stop, 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 stop. I can't. I'll actually Triggered. gag. I'll gag. Yeah. <laughs> I'll gag. I ate a liquid, a saturated liquid smoke <laughs> grape. A hot grape. He he had, God love him. Tommy, if you ever listen to this, God love you. <laughs> but he, he used to pick, we would be out in the middle of America, and he'd be like, I think we ought to go to, like, get seafood. Like, his <laughs> choices <laughs> were just... Oh. Abysmal. They were ab- they were abominable. Actually, is oh, the word landlocked I'm in for. Kansas. He was yeah. like, I would love to get some some ceviche. It would be really nice right now. Like it was such a heinous experience. <laughs> letting Tommy control Yelp duty. I'm happy we revoked it. <laughs> like, I'm crying. <laughs> ceviche, ceviche in Kansas. <laughs> I'm, I'm sick to my stomach. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm really god. crying. Thank oh. you, Creepers, for indulging us in this. We needed a little oh, bit of release. Um, yeah. <laughs> I am happy we covered this case, and I do have, I have, with all these cases, I have a, a sense of optimism that something could come. Something could always come. I mean, yeah. as we've seen. So, who knows? Maybe we will tune in with another episode where we revisit the mysterious... <laughs> Someone was oh. shot in the back of the head. No, that was... Oh, my God. That was someone... That was our office uh, manager just came in and dropped off a huge package. And I saw her coming. Cause my windows are like... my It's floor to ceiling glass. And I was like, uh-uh, don't come in here. Don't come in here right now. She had literally the biggest package I've ever seen. And she just oh comes God. in and just dropped it on the ground did not lower it gracefully i mean i'm dead serious she literally just walked in and dropped it from like five feet up in the air this is such an unhinged episode <laughs> yeah Creeper, I'm I, so sound, sorry. I was like no i was i was like i was like and we'll really never know what happened to timothy pitson boom gunshot boom. to the back of your head killed instantaneously on the pod oh my gosh and with that i guess we can conclude the episode <laughs> Oh, thank you so much again, Creepers. We absolutely adore you. You have no idea. We love you for listening. And Stu and I, we're going to catch you on another Creep Time. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, Creepers. <laughs>